Welcome, Professor Glazer. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. I just wish so I was there in person. Oh, yes. Um, so let me get right into it. Your book, Survival of the City, is excellent. It's also generally optimistic about the future of cities, and it documents the many advantages of cities like New York that still exist. At the same time, you do say that cities are more vulnerable than ever, and that it's never been easier for people and businesses to leave the city. So what's your overall instinct about New York's future? Are you confident in New York's ability to bounce back strong? Are you concerned? I am both optimistic and always concerned. Uh, I remember too well the days in the 1970s when you had a collision of progressive dreams and fiscal realities that left the city teetering on the edge of bankruptcy and seeming like it was at risk for becoming a, an urban dinosaur. I don't think we are there now. I don't think we're close to being there now, but it does feel eerily familiar in the sense that we have new technologies like Zoom that make it easier for people to leave the city. At the same time, we have an understandable progressive hunger to do something about the inequities of, of city life. And the key uh, to, to resolving this, which is in some sense why I wrote the book, is we need to have government, both at the city, the state, and the national level, that functions better. Right? We need to actually not think we're gonna, like we're gonna handle this by just taking from one group of people and giving to another, but we need to actually figure out how to make our schools more effective or to figure out other means of, of promoting opportunity. We need to make sure we figure out ways so that our police force both prevents crime and treats every New Yorker with respect and dignity. Uh, and of course, we need to figure out how to build the amount of new housing that New York desperately needs to become affordable for all. Great. And I love the fact that your, your book really talks about not just those kind of, you know, uniquely COVID challenges, but all of these things like the high cost of housing, like the need to deal with kind of over policing. Um, but let me stick to the some of the things that came up with this pandemic first. Um, you know, specifically, you write in the book that companies and workers have become less anchored to particular places. Um, so what's your advice to New York's current uh, crop of policymakers to the next mayor that'll be coming in in January. How do we address this specifically? So the most important thing is quality of life. So I think when you when you think about, um, you know, uh, and, and I've always believed this in terms of local economic development, that the best and most sensible economic development strategy is to attract and train smart people and then to get out of their way. So there are two elements in this, one of which is quality of life at a not unreasonable tax level. So that's figuring out how to you know, keep New York, retain its advantages in terms of safety, uh, continue to be the vibrant, exciting place that, that it's been. Um, and then at the same time, to do more to reduce the fetters that bind business. I mean, one of the things that's particularly outrageous about business regulation in New York and elsewhere is that we regulate the entrepreneurship of the poor so much more than we regulate the entrepreneurship of the rich, right? You can start your internet phenomenon in your Harvard College dorm room and have basically a billion users and possibly swayed elections before you have any regulators who are interested in you. If you try to start your grocery store that sells milk products, right, anywhere in the island of Manhattan or any of the other five boroughs, right, you have a dizzy uh, array of, of regulations to get through. And particularly as we think about rebooting our small business ecosystem after COVID, it's a really good time to think about whether or not we can slash the regulations or at the very least create simpler ways of interfacing. So one-stop permitting, for example. Got it. And, you know, um, I, I know you mentioned this up, the, up at the top, but, um, you know, you, says, you say in the book that contagious disease isn't the only threat to urban life. And you cite persistently low levels of upward mobility as another threat. You also write that before 2020, our cities flourishes, flourished as enclaves for the wealthy, but they were failing in their great mission of turning poor children into prosperous adults. This certainly rings true about New York. What are some of your ideas about how New York's leaders can reverse this and help more New Yorkers get ahead? So this is, you know, I, I think it's intrinsically bound up in the pandemic to me, because the impact of natural disasters, including pandemics, is always mediated by the strength of civil society. And when those terrorists hit the Twin Towers, New York was remarkably uh, united. I mean, New York was remarkably together behind a pragmatic consensus that had emerged after the 1980s as the city came back. And so the city proved unbelievably resilient to uh, the terrorist attack. And I, I 
you know, I remember at the time, I felt completely confident that it would continue to do so. Um, much of the past 15 years, that pragmatic consensus has unraveled because as you say, the sense that the city is not lifting all boats. Uh, and consequently, when the pandemic hits, we, you know, we have demonstrations about uh, protesting the, the murder of George Floyd. Um, we have, you know, a great deal of unhappiness over a variety of different things. And it's going to be crucial to figure out how to make our cities better places of opportunity and to do so without uh, repelling the rich. Now, in the education system, I think New York continues to need to work on its central cities school district on, on you know, the, the, this incredible machine that it has. Um, but I think the federal government can help, but not in the way that it has been helping. So for the past 20 years, and I think we have to recognize that, you know, if we're looking for an av avalanche of free money, that's going to be coming from the feds right now, right? They're the ones with the extra cash to pay. And uh, for them to be most useful for the city, I think, uh, you know, no child left behind, moving to opportunity, were both federal attempts to, you know, on a shoestring to get school systems to change. In the case of New York, the moving to opportunity uh, implementation was sort of you know, chaotic to disastrous, depending upon your, your interpretation of it, as the state promised uh, miraculous change and, and then found itself unable to deliver it. I think it makes more sense, in fact, for the federal government just to leave the central city school district alone and try to deliver things like wraparound vocational training on weekends, on the summer, on uh, after school that maybe uses school buildings, but doesn't use school personnel that's competitively sourced because, you know, maybe the maybe the trade unions would be the best producers, maybe the for profit companies would be better producers, maybe local community colleges would be better producers. And then the beauty about vocational training, as opposed to whatever this holistic thing we think of as a liberal education, you actually know if someone can be a plumber, you know if someone can do computer programming. And so you can pay for performance in the sense that if you don't train someone to be a programmer, you're not getting paid for your, your training. So you can competitively source it and have pay for performance. And we can you know do it on an experimental basis, we can ratchet it up if it works, but we really need to take the take the, the problems of low inner city opportunity really seriously. And this is a national problem and it deserves national money. I wonder if you can elaborate on the vocational um, idea that you just mentioned and, and say, how, how does that differ from maybe what New York or other cities do right now in terms of training or education? So there are many good things in uh, urban vocational schools, um, but often they favor a vocational track early on. And that is, that's not necessarily bad, right? The Germans do a vocational track very effectively, although America is a country that is very fond of second chances and telling a, a kid at age 13 that you're not college bound uh, is, a, is a difficult thing for that kid to, to, to hear. And it often means that you get less ambitious kids, at least in some of the vocational uh, training programs. Um, I, I think on the other hand, if it's a wraparound, it's not, you're not giving up college hopes. You're not giving up your, your dreams of doing something else. You're just going to learn how to be a computer programmer on the side. That's a useful skill. And you're going to be taught by someone who actually knows how to do computer programming. And part of the virtue of this is because the skills of the 21st century are, are changing so rapidly, the teachers can change so rapidly. Whereas the tenure system is terrible for adapting to new technology. Look, I know I'm a 54-year-old dinosaur. I, I, I barely can keep up with, with things. Um, and you know, we're not trying to change the tenure system, but we're just saying for to make sure that we have skills that match with the ever-changing needs of the market, but let's make sure that we have a more flexible way of delivering those skills. You know, another related issue is um, you know, expensive housing. We talk a lot about this in the book, and I know you've written about this before. Um, and, and how it is connected to, I think, what, what you write about conflict over gentrification that exists not just in New York, but in a number of other cities. What, what's your advice to a city like New York to make sure we can make the city more affordable, uh, which I think is certainly connected to opportunity? Absolutely. I mean, New York has a good model for what affordability looks like. It's New York itself in the 1920s when the city built 100,000 units a year and it stayed affordable. Um, it's very hard in New York, obviously. Um, the easiest spots tend to be former brownfield spots, but um, you know it's the city's got to build. Part of the challenge with making the case for building is 
you know, every time I argue for a little bit more freedom, I get 157 pointed back into my, my face and say, look, this is what your freedom delivers is a, is a bunch of tall buildings built for that will house a grand total of 60 billionaires. How is that solving any, any problem? And I, I, you know, I still think there are pluses from having that that construction, because, you know, if, if you don't think there's a plus, then you're not taxing that real estate enough. So that's that's at least, you know, you should be, especially if they're absentees. So in that case, they do nothing in terms of requiring city services, and hopefully they're paying significant amounts in property taxes. Um, but uh, in terms of you know housing that would make a difference, I certainly would fast track projects that involve lots of little units as opposed to a few big units. I would have a I have a whole system use the regulatory power to make it easy to build large scale amounts of housing for you know ordinary middle income people. Got it. You know, and, and also um, a, a new issue, but in your book you note that the plagues that slaughtered urbanites in the 19th century, like cholera and yellow fever, did not stop the growth of New York, Paris, and London. It's a very optimistic um, uh, picture, um, but in part you say that's because cities came together and invested in things like infrastructure that made them safer and more resilient, like New York's Croton Aqueduct. Does New York need to make a similar investment today, and do you have anything in mind? I don't, so uh, our, my analogy for the Croton Aqueduct is a, an international effort, effort to, fight, uh, to fight pandemics. Unfortunately, cities cannot then pandemic proof themselves against airborne diseases the way they could against waterborne diseases. But it's a great model. I mean, I, I tell the story in the book of Stephen Allen, the former New York mayor and Tammany Hall man, uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, who was the great champion of the Croton Aqueduct. And this was the, the reason why this is not just a New York story, but it's a global story, because this is the moment in which governments cease to be almost exclusively agents of death, which is pretty much all governments do prior to 1800 is they kill people. And maybe, you know, it may be killing other people to stop you from being killed. So you like that, but it's still fundamentally about killing people. Whereas in the 19th century, governments started saving people's lives. And that happened in cities like New York, and it happened at great expense by spending an enormous amount of money on sewers and aqueducts. And you know, this is how we got to, uh, you know, a, a life expectancy in New York that was actually lower than elsewhere in the country, whereas at the start of, you know, 1900, a boy born in New York City could expect to live six years shorter. That didn't happen by accident. That required sustained citizen engagement, and that's sort of a critical element. Like, you don't come in and expect to flip the switch, just like schooling, right? If you think you're going to flip a switch and fix New York City's public schools tomorrow, that's a, that's a fool's belief, right? It's got to have sustained civic engagement that, you know, is ruthlessly pragmatic and is willing to spend money to get outcomes that are actually really valuable. That's great. Um, well, I, I want to say, though, that um, maybe the, the, your model was a global one, but it does seem like a city like New York can or should be taking steps around making maybe making sure there's not another pandemic. I mean, is there is there an idea there? Absolutely. So, well, of all cities in the world, New York should be able to take steps to do to do almost anything. So I think that's absolutely right. So New York should think about how to pandemic proof their city a little bit more. Um, you know, there are local things. So the nursing homes were under the state government. But if I think about where where there's the single greatest health you know, mistake that America made during COVID-19, right, it was the failure to protect the nursing homes. And maybe that was not, you know, a foreseeable thing. But we sort of knew by the time the pandemic came to us in March from the Italian data that it was the old who were really vulnerable. And we should have been willing to take steps to make sure that no one was traipsing from nursing home to nursing home, carrying the disease with them. And we, you know, we pay our nursing home employees very little. So let's pay them double, triple time to make sure they're not moving around. This is a small price to pay relative to shutting down the U.S. economy or, you know, trillion dollar paycheck protection programs. That's something that could, could have been done at the state level. At the local level, you know, you can think about stockpiling personal protective equipment. You can think about various forms of public health initiative. You can think about health education, which also makes a difference. You know, we don't... Um, we don't we don't have a great silver bullet for fighting obesity uh, in this, although we, we have a lot written about it in the chapter, but it's, it's obviously it's a personal choice, but it is a choice that makes you much more vulnerable to pandemic. And the only thing that I feel unquestionably good about in terms of fighting obesity is, you know, education in the schools that makes sure people understand the, the health consequences of, of, uh, of eating too much. So um, those, I think, are things the city the city can do. But it's much harder to actually think about, you know, how, how is it that you start uh, stop a disease from beginning at the at somewhere else in the world? And how is it that you stop it from traveling the globe? That's something that city governments are just not well suited, set up to do. Got it. Last question. Uh, any other piece of advice for the new mayors that are take office in January or any advice of things that he or she should not do? Um, make sure that you're a mayor for all the city. 
right? And it, it's crucial that we not demonize the rich, but it's crucial that we pay a great deal of attention to the needs of the poor. And they, you know, the more that the new mayor can be a uniter who is focused on not more government or less government, but better government on ruthless metrics. So you know, we're very big in terms of how do you get a police force that's gonna deliver both lower crime and decent treatment of people? Well, you need to have measurements of decency, right? You need to set up some instit separate institution that actually tracks how people are in terms of their satisfaction with the, with the NYPD and to do it in all the neighborhoods of the city. So you know, be a manager. Don't be a don't try to solve every global problem. Remember, and I'll just end end with this. You know, there's a famous story about a, a convention of mayors from let's say 1972, when Mayor Lindsay, New York's Mayor Lindsay, was giving a a you know crowd raising speech against the Vietnam War, and he sits down. And Mayor Richard Daly of Chicago leans over him and says, "You do know your job is to take out the damn trash, don't you?" And there there is you know such truth in that. Um, uh, which is the job of the city mayor is to make sure the city is livable, safe, the schools function as well as possible. And it's a job for a serious manager. Um, and it's something that I, I'm sure the new mayor will take very seriously. But, you know, there's no Democratic or Republican way to take out the trash or to clear the snow. And so, you know, ruthless pragmatism is, is the need of the day. All right, then, uh, Professor Glazer, thanks so much. Uh, and uh, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. I just wish I was there in person.